So the choir, the singers remind us that this was Holy Week's challenge. It was Holy Week's battle that the Lord was coming into town, and we're letting it unfold during Lent. And we talked last week about the triumphal entry. So think about as Jesus came into town, as he set to do battle, what was it like? What gave him solace? What supported him? What helped him? Think about what do you do for solace? Do you call a friend? Do you have a good friend? Someone you talk to, a favorite grandparent or an aunt or a friend or confidant, someone to whom you talk and that you just kind of tell everything because they always make you feel better. Do you have that? Yeah, yes. Perhaps they know your history. Perhaps they know all of your foibles. Everything about what makes you feel better. They make you feel better. They know your history. They know your stressors. They know the things that make you laugh. They can lift your spirits. They know your faults. And they know your triumphs and joy. So when you talk to them, you know you're always going to feel better. You're going to walk away. They can, you can say anything to them, even the awful stuff, and you're going to walk away and feel soulless. They know and love you. So you know that. It's great. Today, I want to talk about a place of solace. So I want you to think about that, where that place is for you. If it's a person. But what about what God has set up for us? Because God has set up a place for us. Do you think of God as being a source of solace? As someone that cares about you? Someone that loves you? Someone that might listen to everything you have to say? Even if it's the hard stuff even if it's the worst side of you, that God caring with comfort and relief and God giving support. Someone said in a meeting I went to this week, they said, God is much easier on us than we are on ourselves. Have you ever thought about that? Do you have that picture of God? Let's just imagine God is just like that. Let's think this morning in those terms that God wants that for us. He wants us to be in a place or have a place or see him as a place of solace. Now, you might not think that when I read this passage. You might not see solace at all. But hold on. Don't give up. We're going to get there, and we're going to walk through it and think about it and talk about it especially in light of the Second Chronicles reading. So keep that reading in mind, Solomon's prayer, as you hear what Jesus does. <clears throat> now, last week he came into Jerusalem, triumphal entry, and it was late in the day when he got there, and he went to the temple, and he looked all around, and then he went home. So now I'll read so Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. After looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. The next morning, when they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people, buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. Now, all four Gospels tell this story. And in John, John credits what he did to a prophecy that was given in the Psalms. So let's read the prophecy. It is zeal for your house that has consumed me. The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. In other words, 
I'm taking up your cause, God. So Jesus was the one who took up God's cause that day in the temple. I don't know if we understand what it was like to experience that event, experience what he was doing had you been there. I don't know that we can ever really get a picture. I mean, let's think of 2021. Let's think of our own city, our own church. What if Jesus came in here and began throwing chairs around? I mean, wouldn't we be a little appalled there? Say, hey, don't mess with the carpet. <laughs> what if he found what we're doing wanting and he wanted to set it straight? What would we think or do? We'd be pretty upset, I think. And for those of you who think of Jesus, think of the personality that you see in him, do you think he's meek and mild? Do you think he's just love only? Do you think that he is gentle and, well, we need to get the full impact of Jesus and what he cares about. And this story kind of gives us a little picture. He was kind of Jesus out of control. Jesus really seeing his passion, Jesus who had had it up to here. And he was going to do something about it. He's throwing tables over, comes in with a whip, starts whipping people, starts throwing people out, slinging their money far and wide, calling people thieves. Boy, what a day. <laughs> what a day. He's really upset. Well, why? Why is he so upset? Well, it was festival time. It was a Passover. Kind of coincides with this week. He had already come into the temple the night before. He looked at everything carefully and he left the building. So you wonder, how did he spend his night? Did he go out on a mountain and pray? Did he let kind of that <clears throat> anger, that rage build in him all night? Because he came back the next day in a rage. Well, one way we understand what happened is we look at that scripture in Second Chronicles, because that scripture tells us what the temple was for. And King Solomon wrote down extensive details, not only how the temple was to be built and all the furniture and everything in it, but he also wrote down what was supposed to happen there. He wrote down his prayers. He wrote down how each section was to be used, because it was a massive structure. And it's interesting to me that God doesn't keep secrets from us about that, about worship. We may, there's lots of mystery about God that we don't know, lots of things we won't ever know until we're with God in heaven, but a lot of things we do know. And so he talks to us about worship. He talks to us about what he's doing on the earth. And so there's a lot of things we can know. God shares God's purpose with people. And so we should feel good about that because worship is a wonderful gift. How much did you enjoy worship this morning? Did you enjoy that music? Did you enjoy the children? Did you enjoy a child telling you what it was all about? We do. It's wonderful. It's a place of solace. You feel better when you walk out of here. Well, when we, as the church, and we were the only church, by the way, that went to the flavor of Duncanville, the only representative of the church, there were all kinds of businesses at flavor of Duncanville. What's the, the whole purpose is we're displaying who Duncanville is. Okay, so there's nonprofits there, people with businesses. There were people who run the city government, people who are running for office, but they had to only do that in their booth. And then there was one church. Did you know there's over 50 churches in this city? Where are we staying? No, we got to we got to listen to people. So we decided to do a survey there. And uh, the board is, one of the boards is in the back. And you can see 
I want you to stop and look and see what people in Duncanville, there were um, two questions that we asked. What do you need from your local church? And how can our church serve you best? And we have one of those survey questions back in the back. One of the answers was a safe place. The other answer that was prominent was a place of prayer. A place of prayer. That's what they expect the church to offer and to be. So when we think about the temple, Solomon said to the people that the temple was built it was actually inadequate. It couldn't hold God. It was no building could ever hold God. So it was to be a place where people talked about God. Because Solomon believed God had very special plans. And his intention for the temple was that we connect with God. Now, does that sound familiar to you? Connect with God. Does it? If it doesn't, oh boy. Let's see. Where's the bulletin? It's on there. Connect with God. And so that was one of God's intentions for the temple. It would be a place where prayer happened. A prayer where, I mean, a place where forgiveness happens. Every week, forgiveness happens. It would be a place where foreigners would come. And all nations would be welcomed, even invited to come and learn about the one true God. Come and pray to God. And the reason for designating the temple to prayer was so that all the peoples of the earth would know God and know that God had a name and was very specific. And they would learn to fear him, meaning respect him, acknowledge him, put him on the pedestal that God deserves. So, the temple court, the outside first room, it would be like if you go into a theater and there's a huge foyer. And it said, it actually was a room, and, and that was the first room that Jesus walked through. It was a court of the Gentiles, the court of the nations. That's where all the people that were non-Jews could go and pray. And yes, sacrifices took place at certain times of the year, certain festivals, certain, for certain reasons and things that happened. But remember how Jesus interpreted God's purpose for people who worship. Jesus said this, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. That's what Jesus said about worship. He said, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick do. In other words, you know, every week we need forgiveness, don't we? Every week we need to be reminded of God's love, don't we? And that's what the temple was for, to remind people of God's love, where people could gain forgiveness, the mercy of God to connect with that, the mercy of God which leads to the knowledge of God. Oh, that's what God's like. Oh, I didn't realize that. It's about hope, hope. It's about trust, love. When that love is constant and faithful, it builds our trust. So when we know God personally, we begin to be healed. Because aren't those the things that break us when trust is broken? Isn't it things when we experience hatred or hardship and oppression that, it, that needs to be healed? When we, when we blow it, don't we need a chance for a tomorrow to do it again, to try again, and, and to get... That's healing to be forgiven. This happens through personal relationship with God. Well, what's a best personal relationship with God? Yes, we read the Word. Yes, we learn the Word, but we have to talk to Him. We have to talk to God. It happens through that intimate conversation, prayer, where you can tell Him your heart. 
Remember Hannah. She went to the temple. She only got to go there because she lived so far away. She only got to go there once a year. And she had this nagging problem. She couldn't get pregnant. And the other wife, in those days, they complicated their lives by having more than one wife. And so that other wife taunted her, and she just couldn't live with it. It just hurt so bad. What did she do? She went to the temple. She poured out her heart to God. She connected with God. Do you see this room? And I know it's not just a place, but this is a place. It is a place that you can come, that you can talk to the Lord. But instead of the temple and Jesus' time being set up so people could pray, it was filled with stalls of animals. It was filled with money changers. It was filled with currency booths and all kinds of accessories for your having to make your sacrifice. So thousands of people visited the temple during the festival. This is the outer court as it's described in Scripture. Josephus, a historian who lived at that time, said one year there were 255,000 lambs that are sold and sacrificed in the temple. 255,000! And it all takes place in the foyer where all the other people come. How welcoming is that? It's noisy. Could you pray there? Like, help me get away from these people. <laughs> now, Jerusalem was one of the largest cities at the time. Jerusalem would have been like New York City or Chicago. Okay? So think about, think about the stock exchange in New York. Filled with buying and selling. Or think about in Chicago, the Chicago, it used to be called the Commodities Board of Trade. Now it's called CME. It's two different huge exchanges that take place. That center where you see the little railing, that's the pit where they stand and yell all day long, buying, selling, trading. So imagine Jesus walking through all of that because that's kind of what it would have been like in their day in the outer court was the court of the Gentiles. It was for all nations to come and pray. Boy, oh boy. Boy, oh boy. How was the access? How was the smell? Who would feel welcome? Who would feel that it was a place to bear your soul? Who would feel like they could kneel down quietly in prayer. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So all those people who Jesus knew needed healing, all those people who needed forgiveness, people who needed someone to pray with them, they were absent. There was no room for them. It wasn't accessible to the nations. So the nations were robbed of their place to pray. And God was robbed of worship. Do you know that God loves to hear you worship? God loves to hear you sing to him. God loves to hear your pray, prayers. So you can see why Jesus walked into that entry, right? And put a complete stop to it. With whips, he did whatever it took. Somebody said to me this morning, wow, nobody overcame him. <laughs> nobody stopped him. I mean, he, for one day, sacrifices did not happen. No animals, no nothing, but quiet. But they determined that day to kill him. And so he turned their world upside down. But you know, there's another way people were being robbed. And when they were told that going to the temple was for sacrifice, like if you're told, oh, you only come to this place so you can give money, 
You only come to this place so you can say, try harder. And so sacrifice was a false security. They were trying to appease God with that sacrifice. They were being told that if they made that sacrifice, then God would like them. Then God would support them. Then God would love them. It was false security. It wasn't true at all. Sacrifice is taking a preventative measure so that bad things won't happen in your life. It's not the way it works. God only wants you to do this. He wants you to come in. He wants you to say, you know, it's been a tough week. I didn't do so well. I blew it. And so that he can forgive you. God is just dying to forgive you. Really. Really. Wants you so much to turn to him and give it all to him. Like we say, give it all to him so that he can forgive you. And heal. So Jesus was opening all that up. He was opening up a new way of relating to God through prayer. It's a heart thing. And scripture says, I will give you a new heart, God says, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And we all know we have stony, stubborn hearts, don't we? And that that desire for that new heart, tender heart. And I will put my spirit in you, the Lord says. So prayer is that sort of thing. Worship is that sort of thing. Gaining that spirit, gaining that new heart, gaining that love from God. So let's look at what the prayer does for us. Solomon prayed from Second Chronicles 6. When you hear God forgive. I want you to notice how many times that word comes up. When there is drought, send rain and forgive us for our sins. Teach us to follow the right path when we stray and restore us because we are your special possession. Isn't that beautiful? We're so special to God that he's willing to restore us. When we pray about our troubles or sorrows, Hear our prayers and forgive us. When foreigners come, I love this one. When foreigners come, when all those people from the nations come, grant what they ask of you. Solomon's saying, answer their prayers, God, so they know that you're God. Isn't that a beautiful prayer to pray for somebody? God, that person doesn't know you. Give him his prayers so that he'll know. And in this way, all the people of the earth will come to know and fear you. And then Solomon says, if we sin against you, and who has never sinned, you might become angry with us and let our enemies conquer us, but we might turn to you in repentance and pray. We have sinned, done evil, and acted wickedly. If we turn to you with our whole heart and turn toward this temple and pray, then uphold our Pause. Let us win the battle and rescue us. Forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive, 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 so you can be healed, so you can know his love. It's a wonderful gift to have worship. It's a wonderful gift to be able to come to the sanctuary and to pray so do we appreciate it? Can we appreciate it a little more? Can we walk in with a little more expectation? Walk in saying, I'm going to be blessed today. I am not here just for me sacrificing to God. I'm here to receive healing and love. It's a place of healing, forgiveness, worship and prayer for you, given to you. Allow God to change your heart in this place. Get the most for it, for we are each special to God. And we're responsible for what we do, so we're responsible for being here. We're responsible for praying. We're responsible for connecting. And when we turn to God, no matter the sin, we'll receive forgiveness. There is therefore now what? No 
no condemnation. For who? Y'all get an A today. <laughs> this is an amazing solace. Let us take advantage. Let us enjoy it. Are you engaging with it? Amen.